Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Yale Art Gallery and to this panel discussion of uh, Carrie Mae Weems's performance, Grace Notes, Reflections for Now. Um, we, under, we, we understood this panel um, as a way for people who were at the performance last night to kind of reflect and hear some thoughts about it and perhaps share some impressions of yours. And for people who are planning to go this evening, um, also to do the same. Um, uh, if you notice the, um, the subtitle of the piece, Grace Notes, Reflections for Now, um, is actually asking us to do that and to reflect now. And so, um, and for those of you that saw it and those of you that will saw it, you will see that it's a very powerful call and bridge to being able to do that. And so this panel is in that spirit and I wanna welcome you and thank you for coming. I wanna thank the Yale University Art Gallery, uh, particularly Jock Reynolds, the director, and Pam Franks, the deputy director for collections and education, for enabling this occasion in many, many, many levels. Um, also, the Institute for Sacred Music, Martin Jean, the director, um, and the two administrators who I've been working with in setting up the panel, Melissa Meyer and Nicole Benavinia. Um, and also the Yale Divinity School Senior Director of Development, James Hackney, who also played a major role in um, um, arranging, allowing, making it happen to bring these incredible performers um, here to Yale um, for these two performances. Um, I do need to make a, an announcement. Um, the art gallery actually closes at five and so um, if anybody did the right thing and put your belongings in a locker before you came so deeply into the art gallery, you have to go back now and get them out of the locker or at least before five o'clock. Yes, I was told that people at, at, when the panel is over, you will not be able to get back into the locker to get uh, your things. So you might want to go. <laughs> Um, now and get your things. And then at the end of the panel, because the museum itself will be closed, please use the side exit door, um, which, is, which is there. Um, and I'll try to remember to say that again at the end. Um, uh, we have a brief hour. Um, I'm going to introduce all the panelists uh, together, that is not one by one, and then they'll each speak for about 10 minutes. Um, they have, we all went to the performance last night, um, and um, we've been thinking very deeply both in preparation and after the performance about this occasion, and they have things to say, and then there'll be time for your questions and observations and thoughts um, at the end. Um, and I, I also want to say that I'm, um, you'll see, including a panelist who was not able to come today, Sarah Lewis, um, who was you'll, uh, the curator for the performance of this in Spoleto, and she sent some words to share with you as well. So let me um, go ahead and introduce the panel. Um, our, our first um, panelist is Willie Jennings. He's new here at Yale, but he's been at Duke for a long time in the Divinity School. He's currently Associate Professor of Systematic Theology and Africana Studies at the Yale Divinity School. Um, and he um, is interested in uh, areas of theology, the black church, um, and uh, Africana Studies, as well as post-colonial and race theory. He's the author of numerous articles. Um, he's won awards for his book, and he's, he is, uh, has um, he's just recently won an, a, a major award for groundbreaking work on race and Christianity. Um, our next panelist will be Susan Kahan. She is an art historian and a curator who specializes in contemporary art and the history of museums. Her particular interests are the relationship between art and social change and the confluence of factors that shape the way culture is imagined, discussed, and advanced. She addresses that idea in her recent book, Mounting Frustration, the Art Museum in the Age of Black Power, which was just came out in, uh, from Duke University Press. Our next panelist is Daphne Brooks. She is the uh, author of two books, Bodies in Descent, Spectacular Performances of Race and Freedom, um, and um, uh, Jeff Buckley's Grace. She's currently working on a new book 
which is entitled Subterranean Blues, Black Women, Sound, Modernity. Um, she's the author of many articles, and um, she's a professor here in the African American Studies and Theater and Performance. Um, and our, our last panelist who's actually present is Nell Painter. Um, Nell Painter is a painter, formerly known as the Princeton historian Nell Irvin Painter. She's the author of many award-winning books, including The History of White People, uh, Creating Black Americans, and the biography of Sojourner Truth, A Life, A Symbol. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and she's a former Guggenheim Fellow, and she lives and works in Newark, New Jersey, where her art studio is. This fall, she will complete her memoir, Old in Art School, after a stay at the McDowell Colony in New Hampshire. Okay. Sarah Lewis, who wasn't able to be with us today, is an assistant professor, a new, brand new assistant professor in the departments of History of Art and Architecture and African American and Act. African Studies at Harvard University. She's the author of The Rise, Creativity, The Gift of Failure, and The Search for Mastery. She's on the board of directors of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts of Creative Time, of the Brerley School and the CUNY Graduate Center. And as I said, she curated the show uh, in, at Spoleto. And my name is Laura Wexler, and I'm professor of American Studies and Film and Media Studies and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. And I'm a historian of photography. Um, and it is through photography that I first met Carrie Mae Weems many years ago. And it's as a photographer that I knew her first and longest. Um, and in, uh, I want to just share a context for you that is, has been in my mind in putting, uh, asking people to come today, um, which is um, I'm fascinated by where is photography in this performance? Where is photography? Um, and it, where it is, I think, is um, in the middle of everything. <laughs> I think that um, it, we have an artist who has spent a life in images and working in images, both still and video images. And now we see this moving into theater, performance, sound, movement, rhythm, time, narrative. Um, things that have always been there but are being really made um, m more present. The mid-tone grayscale of a photograph is in the set of this performance and the two windows of colored frames that break the grayscale are there as well. Um, but it's really this question of media that interested me because of the phrase in media race, in the middle of things, in the middle of things, because there's a performance about the fact that we are, the medium of our lives right now is in the middle of things, in the middle of these very serious things. We are not at the end of the history of violence. We are in the middle of what is all these things that are going on, and we need new ways to think and talk about what is the now that we are in the middle of. So with that framing idea about media, and another way of understanding the medium, um, I want to um, read Sarah's words and then ask Willie to come up and speak. When Carrie Mae Weems heard President Obama sing Amazing Grace at the end of his eulogy for the Reverend Clementa Pinckney, it prompted the question that created the foundation of this seminal performance. What is the role of grace in the pursuit of democracy? Grace a radical call to deepen our humanity can challenge us to act where we may have been complacent, to unveil what we might prefer to let remain unseen. Yet when does grace become more than a gesture, but a moral code, even a conceptual framework, particularly after a tragedy? Initially imagined as a response to the 2016 election cycle and as a gift to President Obama and structured as a song cycle, and as a song cycle, Weems's dynamic project for Spoleto, Grace Notes, Reflections for Now, um, which she curated, is a call for new answers to these questions. It is explored with a stellar cast, um, and in this I historical moment, defined by an ex escalation in violence, the events surrounding the Emanuel Nine and the extraordinary responses to these tragedies in this extraordinary moment, what is the force of grace? 
Weems's video work accompanies music and readings on stage by a dynamic group of artists to examine the dimensions of grace in the pursuit of democracy. Grace in the pursuit of democracy. One of the significant moral um, and most important questions of our time. So with that um, framing, I would like to ask um, Willie Jen Jennings to come up. Let's Good evening. Good evening. I want to thank Laura for that wonderful introduction and framing of our of our conversation. I am I am thrilled to be here, as I was thrilled last night to um, witness genius. Carrie Mae Weems is a prophet. She lives, breathes, and dances in that gentle space between the prophetic and the artistic where the deep calls to the deep, and where the joy of creative and disciplined expression calls out to the courage to speak. It is her courage and joy that have made her both prophet and poet of the body in general and of the black body specifically. Grace notes is a marvelous achievement and a long line of marvelous achievements, all of which draw from the deep rivers that she knows so well, those rivers of creativity and conjuring power welling up from the human spirit of suffering black flesh. Weems's work gives witness to the wonder-working power of black folks to do what only a few other peoples in modernity have been forced to do, and that is to make pain productive. We have made pain productive in blues, in jazz, in gospel, in song, in dance, in food, in faith, in fun, with strength and sweat, word and deed, always turning that which should not be but is into something we can use, always turning that which be not as though it were absence into presence. Making pain productive is no glorification of pain, no honoring suffering as a welcome guest. It is a work, a holy work pressed on us, on black flesh, by life in the wake, in the aftermath. We live always in the aftermath, after death, after destruction, after Ferguson, after Flint after Baltimore, after New Orleans, always after. The after space is the space of survival, the space where strategies must be forged to say no to death's reign. And in this country, death wants to reign. We are a country in love with violence, filled with worshipers of weapons, and convinced that complex problems can be solved through fighting. A strategy must be forged. Carrie May Weems' work tells us this. A strategy must be forged for surviving, for thriving, while we are out in the middle of this ocean of aftermath. Grace notes forges ahead. It is wonderful work. Weems has chosen the deeply religious, deeply theological notion of grace. She asked the question, what is grace? Now, I promise I won't spoil this for those of you who have not seen it. <laughs> the question itself draws on Christian sensibilities in their most intense form right at the sight of suffering and harm. To simply ask the question of grace is already to frame a world, a universe, in new possibilities. Grace the question is already grace the answer. Yet Weems' question, what is grace, is really a modulation of the question black churches have been asking since the beginnings of their life in this new world. Since faith was formed in the holes of slave ships, 
and on plantations. The question has never been, what is grace? But who? Who is grace? Grace, you see, has a body. Grace has physical contours and characteristics. Grace was and is despised flesh, a person hated and rejected, acquainted with grief, familiar with sorrow. Grace was and is a person that others assumed was hated and abandoned by God, but they were wrong. Grace is God in flesh, moving and breathing among those who have chosen hate over love, violence over peace. Grace is that one person who will not return hate for hate, harm for harm, but offers life in the face of death. Weems knows this. Grace Notes asks the question, how can black folks, how can anyone be grace or a follower of grace in the current moment? What you will not hear in Grace Notes is the word forgiveness thrown around like confetti. Forgiveness is a word that should not be used in political discourse at this moment. I say this as a theologian who understands the importance and rich legacy of that word. I love that word. But in our political discourse, forgiveness has been turned into rhetorical cocaine that keeps people from facing the addictions to a violence and avoidance and to learned white ignorance of the racial realities that permeate our lives. Grace Notes understands this and therefore it does a different kind of work. It gestures the work of grace where people are invited to live together, facing the real obstacles that keep us from seeing that black lives do, in fact, matter. Grace Notes is therefore a deeply theological work forged for this moment. And I am so glad we have it at this precise moment. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good is it, afternoon. Is this on? <laughs> yeah. And can we have the lights adjusted so that the slides can be seen, please? Um, I'm Susan Kahn, and uh, I'm an art historian, so I'm going to speak like an art historian and not a theologian. Okay, great. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon with you to share some thoughts about Carrie Mae Weems' work uh, to set the current work, Grace Notes, in the context of uh, Carrie's body of work for those of you who may not be familiar with her art. Um, I'd like to thank Laura Wexler and the Yale University Art Gallery and the Institute for Sacred Music for inviting me to participate in this program. Um, I love Carrie's work and it's, it's really an honor uh, and an inspiration. Um, how many of us heard President Obama sing Amazing Grace? Yeah, it was extraordinary. I had never heard a president sing a cappella before. And a cappella plays a very important role in our life here at Yale, as we know. Okay. And I mean a sitting president, not a, not a woofenpoof who would be a future president. <laughs> How many of us have seen a president reveal himself with such humanity, with such humility, and with such intensity. The insistence on the essential humanity of all people 
is one of the themes in Carrie Mae Weems' work, an insistence that constantly shines through like a North Star or like the globes that were held by the performers at the end of the performance last night. And Carrie's work uh, beckons us to become better versions of ourselves. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her earlier work and draw some comparisons between her earlier work and, and the piece um, Grace Notes. Uh, and this is not meant to be an exhaustive survey of her work, but just to unpack some of the density of, of Grace Notes. In her earlier work, oh, sorry about that. Hold on. OK. In her earlier work, Carrie deconstructed stereotypes. Oh, you know what? I, let me go back and do this. Um, why did I show you these slides? I forgot why I picked these slides, and then I remembered. I picked these slides to show you first because I wanted to talk about the way in which this piece bridges the world outside the theater with the world inside the theater. This is one of the opening um, scenes in which one of the actors is reciting text. And as you can see, and those of you who saw the show last night know that the set includes windows or simulated windows. And these windows reminded me of the work of Robert Gobert, which some of you may be familiar with. This piece is called Prison Window, and it also simulates the uh, illusion of a, a window as seen from the inside of a structure. But unlike Bob Gobert's prison window, Carrie Mae Weems' windows do not have bars. They are passageways. They are conduits that allow a kind of freedom. And I don't know if she was actually thinking of Bob Gober's prison window when she designed her set. But for me, this was uh, an, an undeniable connection that I wanted to share with you. So this bridging between the world inside the theater and the world outside the theater is carried on in the beginning of the piece in which we see Carrie seated on the stage while a video plays of her body moving through what looks like some kind of display space. And we're compelled to think about multiple realities simultaneously, multiple spaces of representation and reality. So now, her early work. One of the important projects of Carrie's early work was deconstructing stereotypes, stereotypes that threatened to dehumanize us. In American Icons, which this photograph is a, a part of, uh, done in 1998 and 99, uh, Carrie pointed to the insidious normalization of stereotypes through everyday objects, like these little salt and pepper shakers. In her Ain't Jokin' series, she addressed this issue head on by presenting a series of photographs of African Americans in poses associated with stereotypical traits. But the, the models have deadpan expressions that convey a distinct lack of humor in these fictions. We see in this work also the beginning of another important element of Carrie's work, which is the juxtaposition of images and texts. Here's another uh, example from that series. Uh, looking into the mirror, the black woman asked, mirror, mirror, on the wall, who's the finest of them all? The mirror said, Snow White, you black bitch, and don't you forget it. And those of you who saw the show last night will recall that this is reprised in the show itself. Weems observes the world and invites us to see it anew, often using found images. In this tour de force installation, from here I saw what happened and I cried from 1994 to 95, uh, Carrie created a series of 34 photo and text panels based on historical photographs of African Americans, starting with the invention of photography in the mid-19th century and continuing through the present. Each panel critiques the use of photography in the construction of African American identity, uh, beginning with the recordings of African Americans as objects of study and continuing through the 20th century, including works by well-known photographers, such as Ger Gary Winograd, uh, whose work here, Central Park Zoo from 1967, is one of the uh, last pieces in that series. Carrie is concerned with both telling history and also looking at ways in which history has been told to us. She asks, how does one talk about history without becoming locked into old roles and stereotypes? 
She began photographing herself in the Kitchen Table series from 1990 to 1991, in which she incorporated her own image in a series of tableau photographs that explored the nature and depth of human relationships. All these photos are made within the same setting, a spare table and chairs lit by a single hanging fixture. I'm going to take some liberties here and draw some associations between the Kitchen Table series and other works by other artists, because I think these comparisons can shed light on some important aspects of Carrie's work. The table in art has long been a subject ripe for the evocation of stories. Um, I'm reminded of Caravaggio's The Separate Emos from 1601, which tells the story found in the Gospel of Luke, when the resurrected figure of Christ, traveling incognito, reveals himself to two of his disciples in the town of Emos. And that is the uh, image uh, on the bottom left. Uh, reveals himself only to vanish from their sight. Known as a master of light and shadow, Caravaggio was also known for depicting spiritual scenes in the language of everyday life. Uh, known and criticized for depicting Christ as too human, too human, like Carrie Mae Weems' Caravaggio found the spiritual in everyday life. The table is, in a sense, a tabula rasa, a tabula rasa for the depiction of human dramas on an intimate scale. And in the opening of image of Grace Notes, the table is a place of writing, writing history. Grace Notes begins with Carrie at the table, but very soon we are brought into a world that combines action with imagery, evocations of past and present, and the artist is the performer. Performativity has long been an element in Carrie's work. In Ritual and Revolution, which you're seeing here from 1998, she speaks with a violence that reveals resonances between, is that like a timer telling me to stop? Okay. <laughs> reveals resonances between people and places and across the divides of age, race, gender, and ethnicity. Race and Ritual is a light-filled, maze-like environment of photographically printed muslin that evokes human endurance and courage. A series of images present a range of sites, including a Greek temple, an Aztec rune, a street in Mali, and a Japanese rock garden. Weems herself is pictured in the center as a goddess-like figure. Her voice poetically recounts in a, in a uh, soundtrack uh, instances of oppression and resistance, and here I'm going to quote from that piece. Between the two worlds, I was with you, but as the wind on the Caspian Sea, I was with you in the ancient runes of time. You rode me hobby horse into the age of revolution. I was with you when you stormed the Bastille and the Winter Palace. I was with you in the hideous mise en scene of the Middle Passage. One potato, two potato, three potato, four, and in Ireland, two. I was with you in the death camps, shaved head and all beating the drummer's drum, shaking in my boots. I was with you on the longest march in Cuba and Timbuktu. I was with you in Santiago, attempting to block an assassin's bullet, and again in Harlem, cradling Malcolm to my bosom. Again, we see in this piece an evocation of a historical continuum, uh, uh, acts of violence that are part of our legacy and part of our past. This piece shares a classical resonance with Grace Notes. At times, I noticed that the stage wings seemed almost to, to appear almost like fluted columns. Uh, in Grace Notes, Carrie also gives us three graces. The artist is not only a performer, but a witness, a role she has played many times before. In the Louisiana Project from 2003, created as a commission by the Newcomb Art Gallery at Tulane University in New Orleans to commemorate the bicentennial of the Louisiana Purchase, Carrie poetically explores ways in which the city of New Orleans' unique public culture preserves social hierarchies handed down from antebellum times. She so shows us a city that clutched the customs of the past through the maintenance of plantation culture as a tourist attraction. Sharp inequities between rich and poor and intricately calibrated taxonomies of racial identity that divide humanity into ever smaller separate segments. I had the privilege of writing an essay for the catalog for this project and how cruelly and bitterly Carrie's searing observations were confirmed two years later when Hurricane Katrina hit the city. The 
the uh, breaches in the city's levees caused severe flooding in New Orleans and beyond. The hurricane killed more than 1,800 Americans and displaced thousands more, destroying huge swaths of New Orleans. The federal government made history with its incompetence and mismanagement of the situation. And parenthetically, the catalog for that show is now a rare book because the supply stored in the basement of the art gallery was destroyed in the flood. Carrie borrows from her own work. The silhouette imagery that uh, form the Louisiana Project, uh, as you can see in this, in, uh, silhouette imagery from the Louisiana Project that you can see in this installation shot is reprised in Grace Notes with figures sharing cruel jokes, again, some borrowed from the Ain't Joking series. Like Marcel Duchamp's Bois en Valise, which some of you may be familiar with, the carrying case that contains replicas of the artist's own, own work, Carrie's Grace Notes draws on her own history. Uh, Constructing History from 2008 is a series of photographic vignettes that replicate significant, often, often tragic moments that affected the course of history. You can see here Carrie's photograph on the left and uh, the original photograph on which it's based of the Kent State killings. This is another image from Constructing History from 2008. Uh, Carrie made this work, and those of you who saw the piece and those of you who will see it tonight will note that there was uh, footage, incorporated video footage, of historical events um, such as this um, uh, indelible moment after uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, this, of course, uh, uh, evoking um, the, the shooting of, of John F. Kennedy in Dallas. Uh, the images in this series were produced as photographs and as a video which had an accompanying soundtrack. Um, the piece was made in 2008, around the time of the uh, election of Barack Obama, and the video version of this work includes images of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama's faces, which give you a sense of just how how long she's been engaged with Barack Obama as a public figure. I want to talk about just a couple more things, and then I'll wrap up. The clock. The clock that stands for time, but in which time stands still. Frozen at exactly 3 o'clock and 43 seconds. It does not tick once throughout the show. The clock is borrowed from artist Felix Gonzalez Torres, who made this work, untitled uh, Perfect Lovers, in 1991 when his own lover was dying of AIDS. In Perfect Lovers, the clock, which is battery powered, uh, uh, the clocks, which are battery, battery powered, uh, inevitably um, go off course. One will stop ticking before the other. In Grace Notes, the single clock is the survivor, the one that remains when the loved one is gone. It's a symbol of loss. Carrie commemorates the lost loved ones to unfathomable, raw, brutal violence. This too is something she has long been committed to. In 1992, she made a set of 21 plates in Lenox, China, commemorating the achievements of famous, average, familiar, and forgotten people and moments in African American history. Um, one plate reads, commemorating blues, jazz, collard greens, and Thelonious Monk. Uh, this one reads, commemorating every black man who lives to age 21. Okay. I cried during this piece. I cried when I watched once again the video of the young woman whose boyfriend was shot in Minneapolis and who watched him bleed out and die. But then I celebrated with Carrie and with all the performers that she had brought together, the performers from Yale, the performers from Hill House, the performers from the local fraternity that is working to do good in the community. And I felt privileged to have been taken on this journey with Carrie, which for me 
was many journeys, and I hope my presentation has, has helped share some of those journeys with you. to go after Susan and Willie, that's great. Um, <laughs> I, I'm Daphne Brooks and I'm, I'm getting a sense of uh, how S Laura was curating this session to maybe have us um, speak um, from our kind of critical positions of areas of specialization. I write on sound and other things, but uh, if, I, if I had written something since last night, I would have written about uh, my my friend and someone who I admire, well, there are several friends in that production from last night, but Alicia Hall Moran's um, exquisite rendering of, um, of Amazing Grace as um, a critical question, which um, allows me to think about uh, what Professor Jennings was just discussing, and also about the role of black women vocalists um, in mediating loss. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but my understanding was that we were framing for you all, and this is more of just thoughts that I'm <laughs> going to share with you all. So thank you to uh, Laura Wexler, all of the different publics who came together to make this event possible right here and right now. Thank you to the majestic Carrie Mae Weems for bringing us together in this way. Fun trivia fact, I had the great honor and privilege of first encountering Ms. Weems in the classroom during my freshman year, second semester spring at the University of California, Berkeley. She was my graduate student instructor and course grader in my African American Studies freshman composition seminar, so lucky me. And then first quarter in graduate school, I was at the Hammer Museum in LA with a graduate seminar and kitchen table series was up and I turned to the, my, my cohort and I said, oh my God, it's my TA! So, um, and since then I've been very lucky to um, have been in conversation with her a bit um, and from afar um, in conversation with her a great deal. So Laura asked us to prepare brief comments to provide some context and framing for the performance, whether you saw it last night or whether you're planning to go tonight. Um, so many aspects of this work have stayed with me since last evening, but I thought I'd emphasize the ways that it hails us um, to consider the meaning and potentiality of the concept of grace. And I thought I'd do that by sharing the extended definition of that word that I invoked in the epilogue to a book I wrote a little over a decade ago now on the late beloved rock musician named Jeff Buckley, whose sole studio recording is entitled Grace. So I'm gonna read from that, which is really I'm lifting something that I'm lifting from myself. It's a double lift here, but um, you'll see in a minute. And then I thought I'd share again very briefly an excerpt from a book that I'm working on right now that explores Ms. Weems' work in relation to questions of loss, in relation to blues women's histories, and how her work boldly and fearlessly and imaginatively considers the role of the black feminist artist in grappling with these issues of loss. So loss and grace, two deeply entangled tropes in this powerful performance that offer us recourse in yet another age, or perhaps the perpetual age of deep trouble. Um, so this is the epigraph to the epilogue in my book. Uh, grace, the quality of pleasing, attractiveness, charm, especially that associated, that associated with elegant proportions or ease and refinement of movement, action, expression, or manner. Something that imparts beauty and ornament, the part in which the beauty of a thing consists, a mode of behavior, attitude, etc., adopted with a view to elegance or refinement. Favor, favorable, or kindly regard, or its manifestation, unconstrained goodwill as a ground of concession, the share or favor allotted to one by providence, fate, destiny, luck, fortune, the free and unmerited favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowing of blessings, the divine regenerating and spiriting and strengthening influence, an individual virtue or excellence, divine in origin, a divinely given talent, the condition of a person under such influence. In a person, virtue, an individual virtue, a sense of duty and propriety, mercy, clemency, 
pardon, forgiveness, thanks, thanksgiving, a short prayer uttered as a thanksgiving before or after eating, to confer honor or dignity, to give pleasure, to gratify, delight, that great poet, the Oxford English Dictionary. And from Jeff Buckley himself, quote, grace is what matters in anything, especially life, especially growth, tragedy, pain, love, death. It's a quality I admire very greatly. It keeps you from reaching for the gun too quickly. It keeps you from destroying things too foolishly. In short, it keeps you alive. Grace is philosophy and praxis in the work of Carrie Mae Weems. It is the tool that she often calls upon when confronting questions of loss. So I've been thinking about these sorts of questions in relation to her work, and especially her 1989 piece, Ode to Affirmative Action. I'm so glad Susan didn't discuss it. Or actually, I wish Susan had discussed it, because she would have helped me with that, right? Um, Ode to Affirmative Action, how it captures signature elements of her brilliance as an artist, so often placing her body in the image as a site of artifice and critical memory. She comes to us here in the form of the vocalist Dee Dee, presumably singing her way into and through the infamous Jim Crow policies of the famed Coba Cabana Club, transgressing white supremacist barriers by, by way of sound, even as the condi conditional framing script, if you should lose me, points to the threat of ephemerality. The impending crisis of loss is addressed, if not repaired, on the opposite side of the image by the gold record from the fictional Clarksdale Recording Company, which art historian Richard Powell argues reminds us of the largely African-American Mississippi Delta and US policies of racial restitution encapsulated in her ode. It is an image, Powell suggests, that engages questions of black inclusion, participation, and advantage in a world the world of Jim Crow, or maybe our world right now, that resembles a mob-controlled nightclub, as he puts it. I'm drawn to this image because of what Weems is surrogating in the figure of the vocalist. In this case, Dee Dee Sharp. Open. Oh, well, yeah, I did have sound, but we're not going to, we're just going to see the image, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm, Dee Dee Sharp, the first and in a way, it's actually good the sound isn't here. Dee Dee Sharp, the first African-American woman to break into the top 40 with her number two hit, Mashed Potato Time, in 1962. Sharp's Sound of Young America sits at the heart of new frontier cultural transformations of the modern, even as her fad status forecasts her imminent disappearance from modern life. So I think it's important that we don't have Dee Dee Sharp's voice and we have the traces of, um, of the sonic resonances of what her, her music did in a single moment in time. So Ode to Affirmative Action um, was a piece included in the 1997 Traveling at Exhibition, It's Only Rock and Roll, um, Currents in Contemporary Art, and as I believe the only woman of color artist included in uh, the show, Weems through her piece obviously signaled and pushed back against the precariousness of her own position as a black woman artist who is embraced, temporarily canonized, institutionalized, and yet perhaps is always on the verge of disappearing from these institutional spaces. So vocalist and vinyl constitute this black woman's cultural presence. Each is the other's record of existence, a kind of temporal here-ness, the trace of the other's sound endeavors. Weems re-records sharp through this visual performance that places her body and the object of her sonic achievement in arresting relief of one another. Weems' work is particularly fascinating to me since she returns to these kinds of tropes again and again and again in her work, for instance, um, Slow Fade to Black from 2010, installation which frames and reframes iconic black women musicians out of focus so as to literally and visually, visually disturb the romance of putative hyper-visibility and transparency associated with black women performers, um, as well as the who, what, when, Where series from 1998, which places the phonograph at the end of a series of images of the type, typewriter, the who, a book, the what, a clock, the when, a globe, the where, those are the additional images. So the phonograph in Weems' work is the object of lost intimacies, the talking machine that echoes and reinstantiates the self, and here is mourned as a present absence, the instrument of convivial, reciprocal self-making that, like our mysterious narrator, has now ceased to make noise. I remember long nights and endless discussions with you, 
when we were not afraid to speak our minds, and now I only feel the hush, hush, hush of our mutual silence. Thinking about Weems's work uh, is helping me to continue to work out these questions of black women sonic artists as records and recorders, as archives and archivists, as the mediating figures, who like Weems and, and companies, a stunning performance here this weekend, manage and translate our losses into grace notes that affirm our history and our humanity. So I don't know if we're gonna have the chance to talk about this, maybe we're just supposed to throw this out into the air, but I have much more to say about Issa Davis and um, Alicia Hall Morand and Amani Azuri as very different types of vocalists doing very different types of work in this production, especially if we think about grace notes as being a kind of ornamentation in the sonic. We should think about how ornamentation at the level of sound does a kind of reparative work, but also helps us to think about um, the ways in which black sonic performance is always tied to Mm, or always aspires towards some kind of futurity, some kind of excess, some kind of fugitive life um, that we can imagine together in the ensemble, the space of the ensemble. So happy to be here, and um, thanks for your time. Hello, and thank you, thank you, and thank you. Um, I am here to natter on a little bit as a historian turned artist. And uh, what I'd like to, t I am not uh, as versed with Carrie Mae Weems's work um, as you all are, but what I'd like to talk about is how the, the questions of history come together or don't come together with this performance, which I saw for the first time last night. Um, I was here uh, at Yale about four years ago um, as uh, a fellow in uh, African American studies and, and visual art. And um, uh, Laura actually asked me a question. She said, how does art school, I went to art school for five years after being a historian, how does art school change how you think about history? And I said, duh. <laughs> uh, Kijo Lee tried to help me out some, but I was not ready at that point. But I think what Carrie Mae Weems did with what was really a kind of, at the bottom, historical raw materials, and what she did with them as a performance, she said she started with images. That makes all the difference in the world because historians don't necessarily start with images. Historians start with facts. And historians' relationship to the archive, that is what happened or the documents or the testimony that tells us what happens, when historians start with that archive, we, they, start by saying we have to respect that. We don't pretend it's not there and we don't leave out important stuff. And we step back um, so that you are not looking through a window. You are just there with historical meaning. So as a historian, you simply want to tell what happened with authority. And the question that you ask yourself uh, on behalf of your reader is, is this representative? Is this story telling me something that stands for more than itself? That's historians' responsibilities. When you start with the image, however, that brings you into particularity, into individuality, and it also makes you see that what you see comes from a point of view. And so here, I think, Weems' use of the windows and the... Um, the reader who was kind of telling us, kind of the scribe, telling us what we knew that we were seeing what this was through particular eyes. This was somebody's version of what happened. However, what I found so fascinating about the performance was 
on the one hand, this was historical fact as someone saw it, yet it was about particular people, and we heard their names. We not only heard their names, we blessed them with commemoration. So we were involved in seeing each of them or hearing each of them as a particular person. But the next step, and again, it was three-dimensional, maybe even four-dimensional, five-dimensional, because we heard as well as we saw and we enjoyed exuberance and pathos that there was a way of making each of these tragedies into something universal so that all of us were implicated whether or not we were African-American, whether or not we were male, whether or not we were in those places at those, those times, that it was us as particular individuals, but as part of, part of our culture, part of our society, part of our civilization even. So that was a, a gift of that particular performance that I think says to Carrie Mae Weems, And toward the end, it becomes more even than evocations of African-American culture in sight and sound, or even Antigone and the stories, the human stories that are universal, but also issues of the environment and violence visited on other Americans and even other people, like Vietnam, for instance, so that we have an opening up at the end that really is very generous, very capacious. Now, back home in Newark, New Jersey, I am working on a project on ugliness. And this sent me back into the 1960s and 1970s into Black is Beautiful. And that reminded me of how, how thinkers in the late 60s, early 70s were opening up what had been ugliness, Black as ugly, and turning it into Black is Beautiful by pulling back on aesthetics and saying, that's white aesthetics. Now, I think that's a very emancipatory gesture. I couldn't wear my hair like this if it weren't for that gesture. But on the other hand, that moment in the late 60s and early 70s could not be as generous, could not be as open uh, to our society and to the world as Carrie Mae Weems could be. Part of that was the historical moment. In the 1960s and 1970s, the United States was still heavy in the grip of sanctioned white supremacy. You might want to say now, <laughs> what have we got now? But things have changed. Things have changed and there's a way that there's been a softening of a melting of our culture, our society, that an artist like Carrie Mae Weems can profit from, can use as an opportunity to open and to invite in. Part of, the, part of that is the times that she does not have to stick strictly to the black nation and to people who think exactly like her. But part of it is the genius of a presentation and a performance that works on image, that works on movement, that works on dance, that works on beautiful voices like Imani Uzuri's. that she can embrace beauty, that loaded word, while talking about pain, while talking about trauma. And I want to end by picking up something that Willie said about 
the gift of black folk and the gift of creativity in the midst of trauma. I don't happen to think that that is a, a unique gift of black people. I think it's more widely spread than that. But certainly within the United States and within American history, that is a unique gift. So if you haven't seen this program, I look forward to hearing what you think. If you have seen it, I'm sure you agree with me on its genius. Thank you. Um, we really do need to thank these wonderful panelists, wonderful comments. <laughs> I don't know, Pam, I don't know what is the timing for our being able to be here. Whoops, here we go again, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Great, all right, great. So we have an opportunity to hear thoughts um, from you, share, yeah, Kicho. I think, is. are you gonna go around with a mic? Yes. So first, I want to thank you all for your commentary. It's so important. And I have a burning question. Um, and it's something that I struggle with often. So I struggle with the coalition between race and its religiosity and its claims for beauty and the aestheticization of trauma and its coalition with the pursuit of democracy. Because I think that coalition has been used to beat back liberation mm. time and again, mm. not only of black people but of people. And so I struggle with the kinds of, the, the question not of forgiveness, as you so beautifully put, Professor Jennings, but of transcendence mm -hmm. and acceptance mm -hmm. that we are required to have, rather than, in my understanding with Black Lives Matter, it is one of confrontation, mm -hmm. of embeddedness in the moment not of transcendence, mm. of a reckoning with mm. violence, mm. not of its aestheticization. Mm. So one of the things that I thought was very interesting was the use of step performance, yes, yeah, yeah. that sort of militarization of gesture, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is actually a rejection in some ways of the transcendence and acceptance mm. of, of routine violence. Mm. And I wondered about your thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say something? Yeah. I mean, that was so awesome. We haven't met, by the way. I've been wanting oh. to meet you. Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, the last thing you said about military, mm. militarization of gesture, I just want to gently maybe move around. Um, since we know that stuffing, you know, comes through this tradition of, um, of black fraternity and sorority culture and a kind of disciplinarian, mm -hmm. a disciplinary way of executing social comportment. Now that can be, <laughs> that can be problematic, you know? Um, but I, I think maybe opening up the ways that we think about how the body um, uses discipline, right, as a way to get in formation, sorry, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that it can, it can, right, which actually takes us back mm -hmm. to militarization, but yeah. maybe not, right. um, can be about like thinking about the different ways that we use our body to stay rooted. And so I'm just circling back to, to, to cite you. So I guess, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm having just a, a little bit of a visceral reaction to militarization and trying to open up the different ways those gestures can mean different things things mm -hmm. in the way of survival. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it's yeah. five o'clock on Saturday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, I'm, I'm with Kijo on this. I, uh, di I did think military did yeah. go through my mind mm -hmm. and the next, the next um, adjective to that is masculine. Is what? Masculine. masculine. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. masculinity. And I think that might have been a way almost to cut that sort of religious, Mm -hmm. uh, cloud around grace in a way. Mm. 
Yeah. I think it's, but it's important to remember that transcendence doesn't necessarily <clears throat> need to tie to quietism. Mm -hmm. um, transcendence, uh, especially in the way I think uh, Carrie Mae Weems does in this, uh, grace as transcendence is a, a way to start to think about agency. And I, I, and I think in many ways it is transcendence as equipping agency, enabling liberation, not as, in a sense, shutting it down. The, the constituency, the, you know, the, the, the stuff of agency, the gesture of, of being able to say no is inside of grace. Yes. Even though um, uh, Ms. Weems is very dedicated to the coalition between text and image um, in many ways, uh, I just, I'm always concerned about the picking apart of those definitions, which is why I was so pleased, yeah. Professor Brooks, to hear you read out that OED definition of grace, which hinges so much on beauty. And grace, mm -hmm. are, it was the, it's the container that brought me here. Mm -hmm. I was taught from a very young age that to be pleasing was to make my way in the world. Mm. Mm. So I struggle myself with my own engagement. But yeah. so yeah. it's not to say that the performance itself was meant to shut down liberation, but it's just thinking sure. closely about the terms right. yeah. of very that. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all so much for your expertise and your time with us today. I just wanted to bring to light something that stood out to me in the performance, which was the repeated iteration um, of us being in a time of, yes, we're in the throes of history of violence, and what are the subtleties of that? And the repeated references to the violence of rape and how state-sanctioned violence is as intimate as a forced kiss. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important for us to think about grace as acceptance of joy and proportion and beauty, but what is it in our culture that creates these tolerances for grace yeah. or this tolerance for pleasure? And I think these subtleties of violence, of rape, um, are some of the things that keep us from ascending to grace. Mm. Well, if there are no more thoughts to share right now, there will be many more thoughts to think and share. Amani would like oh, to say Oh, wonderful. Hey, Amari. <laughs> hey, girl. <laughs> Sorry, I got here. Sorry, I got here late. We were in a rehearsal thing. Um, I just wanted to, um, I, I'm so sorry I missed all the talking because I was like, what are they going to say? What's Stephanie Brooks going to say? What's Nell Painter going to say? But I got to hear some. But I just wanted to say that when I, I you know, I wasn't, I'm not a stepper in the show. I'm a vocalist in the show. And, um, to me, the stepping, as a woman who was from the black Greek tradition, believe it or not, without this, mm -hmm. Delta's in there, for sure. But for me, when I was thinking about the stepping, I was happy to see it in there, because I, I think, uh, from what I understand, Carrie invited it in. I don't know if she understands the, the long history of the tradition of it as a, you know, the black fraternal mm -hmm. and sorority, but I think just the, the aspect of protest that's embedded with mm -hmm. it, and the rhythms of protest, mm -hmm. I feel, I feel like that's one of the reasons why she put it in the show, especially where it's placed, because it, right after that, not too long after that in the show, we have a, a poem uh, written by Aja Monet talking about protesting, and then we go into the, the Book of mm. Numbers where you see p people protesting in other ways rhythmically with their body, and then how it's used earlier um, in the show. And also, um, over-militarization, I would say ritualization. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a way for me that I look at the movement as a way of ritualizing this embodiment. And it's, you know, I mean, people who do research on stuff me related to other types of forms beyond the military um, mm -hmm. um, and, and black diaspora kind of cultural. And yeah. you know, black Americans draw from these kind of things by yeah. virtue of how it's creolized kind of culture anyway. Yeah. But um, 
So the ritualization aspect for me, and just like the rhythm of it, like, you know, as a, as a person who's in the show, it's so pleasing. When we did it in South Carolina, we had another group, which was Omega, I'm sorry, which was Alpha Phi Alpha. And this group is, um, one of the groups is led by some Omegas, but involving some of the young men from the area. And then there's a Yale oh, group right. that's multi-gender, queer, and blah, 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 which for me was odd because I'm not used to people who aren't in black Greek stepping. So it kind of took it out of the context of black Greek. And so I really felt like, oh, it is really ritual. It is about this ritual of the mm -hmm. body um, using sound and movement to amplify this kind of passion and, and formation and anger and, and joy and all of these things. So Yeah, yeah thank it's, you. It's also, it's a, thank you, Imani. Um, it's a rite of passage in the context, I'm not in a sorority, by the way, but um, it's, I understand it to be a rite of passage that, and that, you know, when I was an undergrad at Berkeley, people who were going out for fraternities and sororities, there were some of us from the suburbs who were freaked out about having to do that, and it, and it became like this kind of group process to say, we're going to get you through this. We're going to get you over this. This is going to be cathartic. This is going to be um, pedagogical. This is mm -hmm. going to be, you know, this kind of, um, you know, group conversation that we're going to have with each other. So I ha thank you for helping me generate it, that. There's another important thing about it as well, I think, in the performance, which is the youth. And the youth from the area and the students from here and from what I understand from talking with Hazel Curry about the performance and the, the creation of the performance, um, one of the things that interested Carrie Mae Weems about doing this here was our wonderful students mm -hmm. who were so involved and so active, um, which people heard about last year. They've been for a long time, but I mean, that was very special here last year. And I think that's also a gesture it's a, it, it's a ritual in the sense of the youth and how they must be and how and what they have of themselves to play with, to use, to play on, to resist. But it's also, I think, a direct reference to the youth of New Haven and the youth of Yale. And I was, it was very meaningful to me as a professor here to see that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to build on... Uh, what Imani Zuri said, um, but also to say that w one, one of the things that um, visual art gives us and that Carrie Mae Weems gave us in this piece um, is a kind of um, layered, um, multi-dimensional presentation of, well, presentation. So I was going to say of fact, but it's not a presentation of where there's a bit of fact in there, mm -hmm. but there's so much more. And uh, since we as spectators make meaning as well as she as director and writer makes meaning, that's something that art offers us that history tries to do, but since history is mostly in text, it's kind of flat. It doesn't offer you sound and movement and color. So we don't have to make a choice that we can see the military roots of a masculinist kind of performance while we understand the traditions and we understand the meanings for people yeah. within the Greek world as well as the meanings for people who are spectators. Mm -hmm. So I think an, another beauty of this performance, uh, so beautifully exemplifying what visual art can do for us, is the manifold, the complex, even the contradictory. And I have to say also, that I wish that my University of California, Berkeley, mm -hmm. as in right. your mm -hmm. University yeah. of California, <laughs> yeah. Berkeley. Yeah. 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 We're yeah. together in this, Dr. Bader. <laughs> you know, I, your use of the word Greek life yeah, just, right. it makes yeah. me mm. think that there, it could not have escaped Carrie that she was presenting oh, absolutely. a, mu okay. a absolutely. multi textual yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, vision yeah, of yeah, Greek yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right.
Um, that reminds me that one of the, um, thank you all for this, by the way, this has been awesome. Um, the parts of the step routine that I was most moved by was the series of commemorative moves that began with mm -hmm. some version of Tamir Rice would have liked something like this, Eric Garner would have liked something like this, mm -hmm. especially in relation to Professor Painter's comments on, on particularity mm -hmm. and how art can sort of bestow that. Um, and at, at that moment in the, in the show, I thought, I engaged this as a kind of like brilliant and very touching way to get around having to re-expose us to the violence of the videos mm -hmm. while still kind of mm -hmm. addressing the specificity of each of those acts of violence. Um, but then at the culmination of the show, we, we do get those videos. And so I would love to hear your thoughts on sort of how the show creates space for us to watch that or prepares us for them or how that fits into the rhythm of what's come before them. Because um, it's not, it's not. I think it comes before some of the environmental mm -hmm. stuff that came up, but it is sort of towards the end. Um, uh, yeah. Can you, Susan, can you tell us about like how often does she use video in her work? I was trying to. Yeah. Mm. Well, she started um, making videos uh, and pr showing videos mm -hmm. um, around uh, after 2010. Yeah. Um, so it's a relatively new form for yes. her to be incorporating into her artwork. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, mm -hmm. But she had used elements of video, mm -hmm. well, she definitely had elements of video in the Louisiana Project, right. which was back in um, 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been there. And also, she's done video documentation. Right. <laughs> um, she's she's an, an avid archivist. Mm -hmm. um, and she's done all kinds of recordings. She's also done audio tapes with photographers. So this Whoa. is part of what's in the background of right what she's done in her research mm -hmm. and in, in various practices. Right. But really, it was with the Guggenheim show that mm -hmm. that was one of the, oh, May Day's Long Forgotten, I'm sorry. That was in 2000, maybe 2006. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been in the background, but never so much in the foreground. Mm -hmm. She did, in the performance she did, I don't want to lose sight of Sam's question because it's a really important, mm -hmm. but just, she also did in the slow fade to black performance that she did with Jerry Allen at Prospect Park. Mm -hmm. There was video footage that okay. she used that I felt like there were, that some of the footage last night um, of the cityscapes and folks in the street mm -hmm. were very evocative of what she did with Slow Fade to Black. But, yeah, but what but I thought was really um, amazing about the way that she used that found video footage mm -hmm. last night mm -hmm. was the way in which it was um, uh, you know, contextualized within a, basically a work of poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that yeah, and this yeah, brutal yeah, documentary yeah. T material was made, uh, it, it, you know, there are, I've talked to a lot of people about that, the video mm. that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, oh, I can't remember the, his name. I have it down here, hold on. And I want to say it in order to pay him respect. Um, Philando Castile, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. who, 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 Castile, who was shot and, 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 and died. Um, mm -hmm. I've talked to a lot of people and some say, oh, you know, I, I didn't want to watch it because it, it, uh, I, not only is it brutal, but I didn't want to like buy into the commodification of this this footage, and you know, mm -hmm. and and other people who said I couldn't take my eyes off of it, and I mm -hmm. just kept watching it over and over again. Mm -hmm. I was one of those people who watched it over and over again, but mm -hmm. I had never felt the way I did last night seeing it, mm -hmm. and I think that the it, it really it was like a crescendo, a crescendo that just hammered with persistence on the utter brutality of what we're facing now. Mm. Um, and, and it gave a level of specificity to the abstract concepts mm -hmm. that the piece as a mm -hmm. whole embodied mm -hmm. that just made it devastatingly powerful for me. Okay, now it's time to say good night. <laughs>